Well, welcome to Microcontroller Architecture for Embedded Programming. I'm Todd Siebert. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be something of a survey of the architecture of microcontrollers and a little bit of microcomputers and how it relates to how you may get things done on them. And I'll post the slides of links later. So, people talk about embedded. What is embedded? Basically, embedded is any time you put a, con a microcontroller or a microcomputer inside of something such that its activity is secondary to whatever it is that people see on the outside versus going to their laptop or desktop. Um, you may not know this, but modern cars have approximately a dozen microcontrollers or microcomputers in them. Well. Well, I guess it depends on how you measure it, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's, they're just riddled with them. Your washing machine, the, the thing third from the left is a Tickle Me Elmo if you take the clothes off. Frightening, isn't it? <laughs> uh, all modern uh, cameras and whatnot. So what is a microcontroller? A microcontroller is often referred to as an MCU because it's got fewer syllables, right? Or the uh, little mu C symbol and microprocessors or MPUs or UPs. Um, generally, microcontrollers have less RAM. They have less of everything except I.O. generally. Um, and generally have some kind of storage right on the die. RAM, that is. Um, microprocessors generally do with RAM that's off the die. They'll have, you know, you put your RAM SIMs in or whatever they use now. And then we get into cases like SOC, system on chips, which have some of all of it, what you'd normally find in a computer, like a desktop computer, jammed into one package. We'll get more to that later. Uh, I cover this. Ba basically, they're slower generally, they're simpler in some ways. Um, they can be much less expensive, anywhere from three. Three cents for a microcontroller, up to like $20. Generally, they don't run an, an OS, although they can run a real-time operating system. Uh, there's different types of memory in them that sometimes comes up when you're trying to program them. There's, I'm not going to get into this too much, but there's Harvard and von Neumann. You may remember that from your college computer science classes, and you were like, why is this important? It becomes important when you're doing microcontrollers. Um, I'm skipping through some of these because we have a lot to cover, and I suspect there'll be questions. Um, so microcontrollers offer protected address spaces, memory management union, units, things like that, or privileged execution, like you might find in a regular microprocessor that runs a regular OS, but many times they don't. So if you have code running, different places, you have to be careful you don't write over your own memory or write over your own code, depending on the architecture, because there's no one to stop you. Which also means if you're trying to secure the device, <laughs> to make sure no one else can write over, because they can make your code do whatever they want. Um, program memory generally is non-volatile, uh, usually it's flash or EEPROM. Uh, Flash, uh, RAM is generally faster, so some microcontrollers will copy the program into RAM. If they have enough RAM to run it from there, it's faster. So on a microcontroller, instead of the whatever, I don't know, I think my laptop has 32 gigs of RAM. They usually have like 16K to 128K is pretty common, which means you have a whole different idea of how you're going to code. Um, data memory can be anywhere generally from 8 kilobytes to like 256 kilobytes, which isn't a whole lot, you know. Uh, and some have non-volatile RAM where you can store stuff if you like lose power or if you're trying to keep logging data, things like that. But usually it's very small. Oftentimes you're going to want to put that off chip anyway. Instruction clocks. Okay, we don't have generally 4 gigahertz microcontrollers, but they can get up to like about one gigahertz, sometimes higher, but speeds more like 40 megahertz to like something like that is much more common. So 
you don't have generally the raw processing power you would. And for those who don't remember, if you have like a 16 megahertz clock, a cycle, which becomes important when you're programming for these things, is basically the reciprocal of the clock speed. So a cycle for a 16 megahertz clock is 0.025 microseconds, which doesn't seem like a lot, but becomes Im <laughs> timing becomes important when you're doing certain things in a microcontroller. Oh, especially since uh, every, uh, Every instruction a microcontroller runs can take usually more than one cycle. Can be as many as a dozen or more. Uh, like microprocessors, some microcontrollers are super scalar. They can execute multiple instructions per once. Sometimes even have pipelining. You may not know what these all mean. But uh, as you get more powerful and these different architectures come into play, your microcontroller becomes less deterministic in its timing because you don't know necessarily how long each uh, instruction is going to take. Uh, basically, this is about speed and performance. Not that important right now. Instruction set, you know, even like something like division can take 17 cycles. So that's that's quite a while. It gets expensive, especially if you have a small microcontroller. Uh, there's ways to get around this. Uh, Lookup tables, approximations. There's all kinds of algorithms out there you can implement. If if it doesn't actually include like subtract or divide, I mean, or multiply or divide. And then like things we always use in computer science like module uh, it requires division. It's not easy for a computer to do or a microcontroller. Uh, floating point math, r pretty rare in microcontrollers. Again, you have to come up with algorithms to kind of get around it. I've mentioned one called binary scaling you can look up. Um, Sometimes they put uh, floating point units on like a, what's called a peripheral or a different part of the chip and you have to context switch just to get the math going. So there's a cost of the context switch. So you have to decide if it's worthwhile. Uh, microcontrollers have Indianness, which is important if you're trying to transfer data between devices because you have to make sure they have the same, it's basically which one, which byte is first, the least significant byte or the most significant byte. You know, if you're doing uh, desktop development, this never comes up, essentially. 
Okay. Physical aspects. How am I doing on time? Actually, I'm going through this pretty quick, so if you have any questions, stop me. Uh, okay, so some definitions. An IC is what's on a die. It's a piece of silicon. Here's a blow up of an Atmel AT Tiny AT, uh, 13A, which is a really simple uh, microcontroller. Obviously, uh, they're made of, uh, there's various sections on the die, and each section has all kinds of circuits made of primarily transistors, and each transistor is, you know, etched into the silicon uh, in the for, uh, to comprise logic gates, and that's what makes computers work. Uh, the package is what holds the die. So you can get tiny, here's a, a PIC-10F and a SOT-23 package, and you can see it's kind of small. So you can put these things in anything. <laughs> Um, here's one of my favorite, which is an AT Tiny 85. It's an 8 pin dip dual inline package. And then you get these gigantic ones that look like desktop processors with hundreds of pins, which are also nearly impossible to solder if you're like a hobbyist. Uh, so. <clears throat> So how do we get more supporting co components and uh, associated things into a chip? Well, there's different s solutions. We have something called the System on Chip, SOC. Basically, they have put everything on one die, the CPU, RAM, everything else they can uh, that basically is logic-based. Then they came up with basically multi-chip modules. Basically, they put multiple dies in the package and they stack them, uh, they put them side by side and they connect them with tiny wires. And the little chips inside of things like that are called chiplets. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, then there's system in package, SIP, and they basically stack the dies vertically, which saves space and you can put more in there. Then you get SOPs, <laughs> uh, system on package. And like these terms, like it's so confusing why the industry came up with them, but they are what they are. And the nice thing about the SOP is it can in include discrete components like uh, capacitors and inductors and antennas. So you can basically have everything in one package and basically just connect your I.O. and your power. And then there's something called a customizable system on chip, which generally is a subset. It includes an FPGA, thus the uh, customizable part. And we'll talk more about FPGAs later. So as a simple like uh, side view diagram, this is what they, they look like. So you can see, can you see my cursor? Yeah, you can, nice. Um, so you can see in SOC, everything is uh, side by side. And in uh, MCM, these are the chiplets, like this little box here. They can put them side by side. And, uh, and you can see there's wires going through the substrate and then system in package, they stack them vertically to save space, which means, but things have to be connected vertically instead of going through the substrate. And SOP, they kind of throw everything in there in whatever way. <laughs> uh, the, the result of this is, whereas a chip used to do one thing, now it can do pretty much an entire computer in a package or Wi-Fi and communications and things to that, like that. Um, here's an example of the, uh, this is the, uh, the TI uh, SIP. This is the one they use in the Beagle Bone Black, I think. I thought I wrote that down. But it's nice because it actually has an ARM Cortex-3 uh, microprocessor and two of these PRU, programmable real-time units, which is basically uh, a, micro, a microcontroller with a deterministic instruction set. And it's all in this one package, so you can just pop it into your designs or into your breadboard, whatever you're doing. Yeah? Well, I, 
Well, okay. So yes, <laughs> interrupts can definitely throw off your deterministic. But uh, like a microcontrollers used to be basically every instruction took uh, so many cycles. So you could just, if you needed something to happen like every 24 cycles, you knew you could only get three instructions going, right? But now with like pipelining and superscalar and different instructions taking different number of cycles, it's hard to, to know how long something's gonna take because even if you counted the instructions and amount of cycles they take with superscalar and pipelining, like you don't really know, it's kind of up to the chip. Um, but with something like the uh, PRU, you know everything. There's no superscalar, there's no uh, pipelining. Everything is the same number. But <laughs> if you program using interrupts, which is a generally good idea, do you have to take that into account? Uh, so I will talk about that a little. Um, but many things that a microcontroller come down to timing. And if you don't know how things are timed, then it gets even more complicated. Um, so you can see this down over here it includes EE prom. It's got a, a L, uh, LDO power. Anyway, okay. So I think chiplets are really exciting. There's been a lot of uh, talk about them over the couple, last couple of years. They can use them in M MCMs, SIPs, and SOPs, and that means they're basically commodity, tried and true, reusable, cost effective pieces of silicon that do one thing, basically. Either it's the memory, or it's a cache, or it's uh, a logic block, or it's the processor itself. And basically, kind of like Legos, you can kind of stack these things in a package and get basically whatever you want out of that chip. And since you're not trying to make this huge piece of silicon, which gets expensive and you have more of a chance of a failure, because you've had this big piece of silicon, if you break all the functions up into it, their own pieces of silicon, you have a much better chance of having higher yields and lower costs. So manufacturers are pretty excited about this. Um, there's been some issues about uh, durability and manufacturability, and like all the vendors have their own standards, but we'll talk more about that too. Oh, right now we'll talk about it. <laughs> so the open compute projects, uh, open Domain Specific arch Architecture, o ODSA, started in 2018, and basically they're trying to standardize how all the chiplets talk to each other. It's basically similar to an OSI, ISO model, if people remember that from way back when, probably CompSci class or whatever, uh, or networking. Um, this way, you can basically take cross-platform, cr cross-vendor commodity chiplets and get them all to talk to each other, which basically means you can make any chip uh, from whatever parts you feel are best. And then the Linux Foundation started the Chips Alliance way back in 2009, and uh, they're more about uh, making IP available. Uh, so you have a quote here, organization develops and hosts high quality open source, blah, 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 IP, and interconnect IP um, and open source software. I don't know they're making a lot of progress, but it is promising. And so this way, not only will you be able to have a chip, but like all the components in the chip will be open source. Because we talk about open source, there's like a couple vendors upstairs with like open source laptops or open source routers. But when you get down to it, the chip isn't, <laughs> right? But we're moving towards a time when that's actually possible. Um, and even Intel contributed uh, the AIB, a royalty-free uh, physical layer connecting semiconductors in a die. So even Intel, I was surprised. Um, and there's like a company called Zglu, basically offering custom MCM chips in small batches. So theoretically, if you had, uh, you're, you're an IoT vendor or even a Kickstarter, could theoretically order, I don't know, 1,000, 10,000 custom chips based on, maybe if you got lucky, maybe all open source chiplets, maybe close soon, 
We'll see. But I think that's pretty exciting. Okay. We're talking about something different. So, in a microcontroller, we have something called peripherals. And um, a peripheral is a type of interface that's on the die itself. Uh, and the interesting thing about them is they run independent of your code cycles. So even if your code is doing something and you have a, a PWM, that's a pulse width modulation, going on, that's a would-be a peripheral, running on a pin at like 50% duty cycle, it keeps toggling back and forth regardless of what your code is doing. So it doesn't really cost you anything. So it's not really multi-processing, but they run independent. And there's lots of different peripherals that can show up on various microcontrollers, analog digital converters, DACs, uh, serial peripheral interface, uh, you've probably heard of a SPI connector or SPI bus. Uh, there's TWI, two-wire two interfaces. These are all communication types. Uh, sound interconnects, USB, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, I'm sure you're all aware of. All these things can be on the die or not depending on the microcontroller you buy. I feel like I skipped. No, I think it's coming later in the, uh, in the slides. Um, timers and counters are really common. Peripherals to have, they're great. Again, for timing, if you need to know when some kind of time has passed. Um, control area networks. Uh, they're, that one's popular in cars, as we talked about how many dozens or maybe hundreds of microcontrollers they have in modern cars, real-time clocks, GPIOs, that's general purpose I.O., uh, various memory in, in, interfaces, and as I mentioned before, uh, uh, floating point units, possibly comparators, UARTs, which is basically the serial communication, watchdog, and another uh, communication uh, protocol called OneWire. Some uh, special purpose microcontrollers have all things from uh, memory, different memory controllers, crypto um, units, uh, graphics, infrared, motor controllers, you name it. If uh, some manufacturer thought there was a market to put some kind of peripheral in a, on, a, on a die, they've done it. And there are many. Uh, generally, as microcontrollers get more expensive or larger and usually faster, they include more types of peripherals and often multiples of each. It's not uncommon to see two, three, four different UARTs, a couple of spy buses, dozens of GPIOs. But some microcontrollers have as few as six pins, and you get like one because you just wanted to do one thing. Uh, I kind of covered this. Um, Generally, each peripheral is, and historically, they were tied to one pin. So like that one pin did a GPIO and maybe it did something else, but that was it. And if you had to use that pin for GPIO, but you also wanted it for UART, you were out of luck. Most of the ones we're seeing newer have like what's called crossbar or matrix allocation. So you can basically assign a GPIO to whatever pin you want, which also makes uh, board layout easier because you don't have now a GPI put in on the wrong side of the chip from where it needs to go. I don't know how many people here are familiar with board design, but it can be a real pain in the neck. Um, now, if you don't have a peripheral and you want to do, like, say, I2C or a UART and you just have GPIOs, you can do something called bit banging, which is basically timing all the signals you need when you need them to happen and basically reproduce the entire protocol and code, which for things like serial and UART is pretty easy. If you want to do I2C bit banging, find a library because <laughs> it's really easy to get wrong. And this is where things like deterministic becomes into play because if you, you have to really pay attention to get the timing right, and to uh, her point, like if you have interrupts, keep interrupting your machine, you're not going to have the timing right. So if you need the peripheral, it's best to get it you know, on the chip. But if you have to, you can, you can bit bang it. Any questions so far? I feel like I'm covering a lot. Sure. 
No, the peripherals are on the die. Right, you basically, we'll talk about uh, memory mapped. Most peripherals are what we call memory mapped. So, how many people are familiar with Unix device drivers? Okay, Unix stuff is file mapped, right? If you get, want to get IPO, IO, you write or read from a file. On a microcontroller, they're memory mapped. So, there is no file system, right? So, all you can do is there's a part of memory and uh, there's some byte someplace, and it's all going to be in the uh, data sheet, which for my controller can be like a thousand pages, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, the you'd write to a particular byte in a particular bit, and uh, say you want to make a GPIO um, output, or in this case a, a PWM, let's say. That now, and they all vary across manufacturers and across lines. So theoretically, you could say, okay. I want this pin to be a PWM. I'm going to, you know, flip a bit to enable it, and then I'm going to flip a bit, another bit to say it's an output, and then I'm I'm going to flip a, another bit to uh, set it into a particular mode, and then I'm going to write to a byte, like say 128, to make it a 50% uh, duty cycle, and then. You're going to have to write another byte that's going to be like the frequency, and there's probably clock dividers and things like all you need to do, write all that, and then suddenly you have PWM. But once you write all those bits and bytes, it just keeps doing it. Yeah. I don't know, that was probably a lot. Wasn't planning to get into that, but <laughs> no, no, it's quite all right. Uh, yeah, cool. And I often I do a, a second section where I get more into the coding. Uh, so speaking of pins, <laughs> here's the uh, AT Tiny 85, one of my favorite little, I use it for everything type of cheap little uh, uh, microcontroller. And you can see like here, pin one is PC interrupt five. It's also the reset pin, also ADC zero, and I don't remember what DW is up to the top of my head. So this one has multiple you know, three, four different functions available on each pin. So to kind of like the last question, if you want to use it, that particular pin for a certain thing, you have to go tell the microcontroller it's for a particular thing. And then uh, there's lots of bits. And uh, probably people have heard of, uh, oh boy, on the spot. Uh, I'll get back to it, I'll think of it. Um, and this is a simple microcontroller. Oh, I know, Arduino. <laughs> How many people are familiar with Arduino? Right. So, you know, it's C-ish. It's really C, C++, but they, put all, they make all these macros. And these macros allow you to set, like, oh, set pin 1 to be output, right? Well, it's just a macro. <laughs> And what it's doing is it's flipping all those bits and doing a, if you want channel one, it's got to map channel one or pin one rather to a particular memory region and then it flips all the proper bits and it does it all for you. But like in your code, you just write, you know, pin one output, right? <laughs> and it, all that, the guts is hidden below, uh, which is nice because it's a nice level of abstraction if you're kind of just getting into it. Uh, but you can do all those things. You can you can write Arduino code without using any of the macros. You can just write it in C, but you just have to look up what all the the bytes are. Uh, okay. Uh, here's an ATtiny 828, a little more complex. Here, there's lots of different pins doing lots of different things, and they've color coded like power, analog, or. Uh, a serial interface or a timer. And then you get this TI. I think this is the same TI from the Beagle Bone, went on the Beagle Bones. And here they don't even try to put all the different peripherals available on each pin because it's just it just becomes unreasonable. But at least you know which pin is called what. Okay, power management. You know, I suppose if you have a laptop, you're concerned about power, but you know, if you have a desktop, it's just plugged into the wall, and no one really cares how much power it takes. If you have a microcontroller, most likely 
you know, it might be battery operated. You know, if it's running on a coin cell, you have to really be cognizant of how much power you're drawing. You know, and I guess we should be green and we should be, you know, keep this in mind somehow. Uh, but depending on the microcontroller, they have various states. Uh, you can, they have like low power, sleep, and really it depends on the vendor and the product line. Um, sometimes you can change the clock speed. Um, but you can usually get them down to really, really low, like in the tens of nanoamps. So when these things go into like these low sleep states, they can really take, you know, almost nothing at all. I've seen people run microcontrollers on a coin cell for a year because it only wake up when it needs to wake up, usually via an interrupt. And then you have to pay attention to what peripherals because in certain states, certain peripherals will be not available because they take too much power. Or, uh, or you might have to do certain things, like you want to, uh, some peripherals will just draw power. Like if you set up a pin pull-up, it's gonna pull, it's gonna take power because you're doing a pull-up. Um, everybody know what a pull-up or a pull-down is? Okay, so generally, if you have a pin and you send a high out, it's high. You know, 3.3 volts, 5 volts, whatever it happens to be, 1.8 volts. If you put low, it's zero. But if you don't do either one, it's basically an, an indeterminate state. And uh, if it's in an indeterminate state and someone tries to read it, it could be anything. It could be high, it could be low, it doesn't matter, right? It depends on inductances and all kinds of things you can't really control for. So you have to pull up or pull down the, uh, the line, usually with a resistor either to your VCC or to your ground, and that way you keep your signal in a determinate state. There, there's the 30 second version. Some microcontrollers have the lovely ability to be put into a sleep state, with, and unless you've remembered to tell it how to wake up, it won't. So that's probably good to remember. Uh, any, anything else on? That section, any other questions? Okay, programming, this isn't like basically how to program one, but like physically how to program one. Because you can't just like load a DVD or call up your editor on the microcontroller. Um, at some point in time we had to like erase them using UV light sources and crazy crap like that. But nowadays, uh, generally all you need is a USB to TTL serial adapter like the one pictured, and uh, they're cheap, even if you buy a, a name brand. Um, and then you got development boards like the Arduino, which you just plug a USB cable into, so it doesn't get too much easier than that. Then there's something called an, ins, an uh, ICSP, in-circuit serial programmer, or in-system programmer. Basically, they allow you to plug something into your board so you can program it if you don't already have, if it doesn't already take like the serial to TTL or USB. Because it used to be you had to remove the chip and put it in a special programmer, which probably cost a lot of money. Uh, but now generally they've made it a lot easier. Um, then there's uh, JTAG, which is joint action, test action group, whatever, no one calls it that, JTAG. JTAG connector has some number of pins and you can program and debug your code. There's a, I won't get into this too much, but the nice fun thing about microcontrollers is once the code is running, you have no idea what's going on in there. There's no console, right? There's no screen. I mean, sometimes there can be, but vast majority of the times there's not. So um, there's all kinds of techniques you can do to debug them, but I'm not covering that in this talk. How are we doing on time? I got 20 minutes. Okay, um, vendor-specific programmers slash debuggers are available at Mel Ice. There's a nice open source one called One Bit Squares Black Magic Probe for ARM. Uh, it's on the left. The uh, the pick uh, microchip pick uh, programmers on the right. Um, 
nowadays they're making it even easier to code. Like uh, some of the dev boards, like from Adafruit, you plug them into USB and it mounts as a drive. And you can use your favorite editor to edit. Usually it's a Python or a Circuit Python program. You can edit it, and as soon as you save it, it reboots, it restarts the control, the the board, and your code is live. I mean, that's super simple. It's a good place to start if you're not already in this kind of arena. Uh, I mentioned debugging. Yeah, debugging gets funny, <laughs> but. Uh, in best case, you can do things like breakpoints, step overs, watches, stuff like that. Like the black magic probe is, see that thing in action, it is like magic. Um, oh, wait, I did talk about this. Um, if you don't have hardware debugging, you can do things like writing through a serial connection or toggling an LED or driving a seven segment LED uh, display and outputting like an error code. Um, the thing about this is they all take system cycles, right? So if it, you're trying to do something timing sensitive and then you take time out to write something to an LED, you're now messing up your timing and it's called, it creates what they call Heisenbugs. <laughs> Uncertainty. Okay, interrupts, briefly. Uh, basically, the hardware or software generated and they call what's usually called an interrupt service routine or interrupt handler code. Uh, Usually microcontrollers are simple, like you have one interrupt and you go to the interrupt routine and you can't service another interrupt until you're done with that code. Other ones offer priority interrupts or interrupts within interrupts, but if you have to deal with interrupts within interrupts, then your brain will hurt. Uh, but then again, if you don't handle your interrupt quick enough, you may miss the ne next interrupt. So. Um, and software interrupts can be generated by user code, stack overflows, uh, part of your code throwing um, a software interrupt. And hardware interrupts are generally generated by peripherals such as GPIO. Like you want to know when data shows up, right? Or a peripheral like your uh, LED, um, your, in, your IR peripheral receiver has received data and it wants to let your code know. How does it let your code know? It throws an interrupt and you grab the interrupt and then you go grab the data. Um, interrupt driven code is basically how you want to do things. Otherwise you have to pull and you don't want to pull. So learn interrupts if you don't already know them. Uh, it's a little more complex, takes a little more effort, but it's the right way to go. Uh, Real-time operating systems basically are basically like kind of like the kerneling or scheduling portion of a, like a full operating system that can run on a microcontroller to kind of help you out if you're trying to juggle multiple real-time, you know, input outputs. Uh, generally can't run them on the simplest of microcontrollers because they simply just don't have enough cycles. Uh, there's a number of commercial ones and open source ones, so. Um, configuration bits. So they are often called fuses or fuse bits and they're basically out of band, non-volatile toggles that change the way your processor work. Everything from clock speed, divider, watchdog timers, debugger enable, like a lot of commercial products you buy will have JTAG disabled, debuggers disabled, and it's a, it's a permanent fuse. So and the commercial product, they'll disable all that, so you can't go in there and hack it. Of course, if they do, you can't fix it. <laughs> and if they do enable it, you might fix it or you can hack it. So <laughs> it's a double-edged sword, I suppose. Ah, yeah, there are DigiKey, which is a popular uh, distributor of all things electronics, lists 76,000 different microcontroller SKUs. It's a little overwhelming. Um, basically, there's ARMS and MIPS. They license out their cores for other people to manufacture. Um, I think the important thing to know about this is uh, the IP that goes into uh, a microcontroller can be used other places. I'll get to that later. And something called uh, 
but peripherals and hardware abstraction layers vary a lot. So you, you, you're always going to be reading through that data sheet. Uh, we have the microchip, Atmel, AT Mega, and ARB variants, the ones you see in their Duino pack, uh, uh, products a lot. Microchip PICs, I know a lot of people were really into PICs for a long time. TI makes a bunch that are popular, like the AM335, which powers the Beagle boards. Um, the ESP8266 and the 80, uh, ESP32 are relatively new. They're really great. They have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Especially at ESP32, you can do a lot of fun stuff. Parallax Propeller, although I haven't heard from them in a couple years, and uh, a couple more SDM microcontrollers makes it really popular. SDM8 and SDM32 lines. Now it brings us to the Risk V uh, Foundation. Have people heard about these guys? Completely open source cores, uh, all kinds of uh, opcode extensions and Basically, you can use them as long as you become a member of the foundation, which is, you know, a nominal cost. Uh, it's really great because all the chip designs used to be all proprietary, but now we have a real successful uh, core that's open source. Um, I kind of already talked about this. Uh, Sci-fi. Uh, is a company that's been producing a number of open source boards using the open source uh, RISC, uh, RISC V processors. And everybody's getting on board. Like, not a week goes by where I don't hear about some big manufacturer uh, like Western Digital, NVIDIA, Sager, uh, Qualcomm. All these people have, have joined the foundation and are going to start using open source cores. Um, FPGAs is the last section. Hopefully I'll have enough time. So FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays. They're basically a unique type of IC which basically allows you to change what the chip does because you can change how the chip is basically wired inside. How many people are familiar with FPGAs? Oh, okay, good. You all know. <laughs> so uh, this is a comparison to basically general purpose processors, which, you know, they have their own defined opcodes. They have, their, you know, whatever whatever they do is the way you get it. But in FPGA, you can basically, quote unquote, re reprogram to basically do what you want, how you want. And you're basically laying, laying out logic blocks. You're not coding as in like C. You're fundamentally changing the way the processor routes uh, data inside the chip from logic block to logic block. Um, so FPGAs are used uh, for develop development leading to ASICs or directly in products sometimes where you don't have enough quantity to make an ASIC or it's just not the right. There's no, out of those 76,000 mic uh, microcontroller SKUs, it's just one of them just doesn't fit your needs quite right, sometimes it's price. Or if you want to iterate, if you have a, you know, a new product and you're iterating on that thing a lot, FPGA, FPGA is the way to go because you can just keep changing it. And uh, I guess if you had a bug, you can fix the bug too, versus, whereas if there's a bug in your microcontroller, it shows up in the errata and it drives every developer past that point mad. Um, yeah, always read the errata. Um, so here's some history. The precursors started way back in the 1970s. There's different variations. Uh, I'm going to skip all this stuff for now. So we have time for questions. Um, I guess the uh, thing I point out about this slide is generally they're measured in logic blocks. And it comes kind of comes down to marketing and what the manufacturer wants to do. Sometimes they're called LUTs or labs or CLBs or logic blocks. And uh, everybody's idea of what a logic block is is different. Like, how many NAND gates does it have? How many AND gates does it have? Well, it depends on the manufacturer. So you can't say, oh, look, this one's got 10,000 logic blocks and the other one's got 20,000 logic blocks. These numbers are not comparable. Okay, so FPGAs really started in the 1980s. Um, 
One thing different from some of the precursors is they're basically a blank slate on power on. So you have to pull in their configuration from some external memory, uh, you know, some kind of uh, non-volatile memory, and that's what makes the FPGA become whatever it is you want it to become. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Uh, FPGAs are programmed in what's called a HDL, Hardware uh, Description Language. And uh, this is the type of thing that actually ARM licenses to the HDL, uh, or not the HDL, but in an HDL, the design of the core from like ARM is what they license to other manufacturers who want to produce like an ARM core. Um, and while some HDLs look like code, they're not compiled, they don't, they're not interpreted, they don't execute the way you might think if you're a coder. Um, there's different HDLs like Verilog or System Verilog or VHDL. Um, and there's a number of EDA tools, uh, electronic design, I can't remember what EDA stands for, sorry. Um, but the nice thing about uh, FPGA is you can take your H, you can take your code and run it in a simulator beforehand. And there's, you can do something called formal ver verification, which uses math analysis to actually guarantee that the, what the expected output is will actually be the output. I mean, we never see this in regular coding, right? So you can run tests, but this it verifies it formally in math, which is a pretty good, pretty good sign that it's going to work. Uh, here's some sample Verilog, simply because it kind of looks like C, but it's not. Uh, the funny thing about most of these things is all the code happens simultaneously unless you tell it not to. <laughs> so code execution does not go from top down or things like that. It all happens, yeah. It's, it's hard to wrap your brain around, um, but it's really fascinating. Um, Historically, all the FPA, FPGA tool chains were all proprietary, closed source, secret, and stupid expensive, uh, and largely undocumented. But now we have something called Simpaflow, which is a completely open source tool chain for programming a number of families of uh, FPGAs, which is pretty exciting because you can actually get an open source core from uh, RISC-V and using an open source tool chain, put it on an FPGA. Now the FPGA so far are not open source, but well, we're getting closer. Um, and I've talked to some of these guys, like the amount of effort that went into doing this tool chain is immense because they basically had to reverse engineer bit streams. And this is a non-trivial task. So if you see those guys, thank them. Um, there's a number of uh, open source FPGA boards, like the Icebreaker FPGA, and oh, I still have like nine minutes, right? I think so. Um, kind of touched on this, some processor cores, such as RISC-V or ARM, are available in HDL, so you can, you can basically download that core to your FPGA and say, it's a RISC-V without a floating point, and then you, later you realize, oh, my application really needs floating point. You just go grab a different core, put that onto your FPGA, and now you've got all the functionality you need. Um, so then if you're going to use like a microcontroller core or even a microcomputer core, when, once you get the FPGA running the core you want, you would then, you know, connect to it and actually program it and see or load in, you know, so there's really two steps. You have to program, quote unquote, the FPGA, and then you have to actually put your executable code on it. Uh, so FPGAs, basically, they're inherently multiprocessing because you can have any number of cores in there, uh, as many as you want, really, that will fit. Uh, so they can be massively parallel, uh, basically have any peripheral you, you, you could possibly want, flexible, as I mentioned before, you can re reconfigure them. Uh, they're a little bit slower, generally they don't have the performance as a dedicated uh, microcontroller. They generally take more power and they're more expensive. Um, 
But you can get them now, simpler ones, for just a couple dollars each, which is huge because they used to be like many hundreds of dollars. Um, some, there's hybrids, like some FPGAs come with hard block microcontroller codes embedded in, in them, so you can't change that part, but you can change the FPGA part around them. And then now some regular microcontrollers have what they call custom configuration logic or whatever the marketing term they have for that brand. And they, they have certain sections of your regular microcontroller you can configure to do certain things. So it's interesting how there's now a, uh, like a spectrum of completely dedicated to completely flexible in various uh, pl stages in between. In fact, even the new uh, Arduino uh, Uno, uh, Uno Wi-Fi includes some custom configuration logic blocks in there. Oh, and that's me. So, I made it. <laughs> Questions? Sure. So the question is, uh, while RTOSs can help you with real-time, especially when you have multiple real-time things running, if you move your, want to move your car code from one microcontroller or to another, all the, as I mentioned before, all the peripherals change, all the ways to a, uh, access them change. So he wants to know, are there peripheral libraries that can be used, like uh, abstractions that can be used across product lines? And, Frankly, I don't know of any. I mean, that's basically what Arduino does, right? For all the ones Arduino handles, of course, it's not an RTOS, but they abstract. So if you just said, set pin one to output, it has all these ways of trying to figure out which chip you're on, what is actually pin one, and then flipping all the bits. That's why it's a little bit slower, because it has to do all this figuring things out. Uh, you know, if if you really think you might be changing microcontrollers or whatever, it's probably best to abstract in the code yourself. And then you can do like pound defines if you, if, if you have to support multiple uh, microcontrollers at the same time. Um, but at least if you write your code modular and abstract all your I.O., at least you have a fighting chance later on. <laughs> Yeah, agreed. The learning impact uh, going, e even learning one chip and how to access all its peripherals. Now, if you're going to use uh, like open source tools and you're just going to use, you know, like uh, uh, C compiler and uh, just your favorite text editor and stuff like that, you're not going to get anything like that. But if you use like Atmel's commercial IDE, it usually comes with all kinds of bits of code and ways you can just drag and drop uh, like routines to access like I2C easier, but it's all vendor specific. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that helped, but anyone else? Okay, good. Well, hopefully I gave you uh, a good overview of what <laughs> microcontroller architecture is like and what you're facing if you get into it. And uh, well, thanks for coming.